are just actors in a TV show. What happens at the climactic ending of the film is, is one of my favorite scenes in, in all of cinema. Um, spoiler alert, uh, but again, it's been out for longer than I've been alive, so you, I don't feel too bad spoiling it. Truman makes a big escape. He realizes that there's cameras on him. He realizes everybody is acting around him. And so he finds a way to sneak out of his house without the cameras realizing it. And he makes his way to the edge of town, to the water where the, the quote-unquote ocean is. He hops on a boat. And meanwhile, the cameramen, the production team, the director, they have no idea where he is. And he sails on a boat to the edge of the ocean, which is really just the edge of this huge TV set. And he comes to this, this stairwell that's painted to look like the sky, so it blends in. You can't see it, and there's a little, little stairway, and then there's a door at the top of it. And right as he's going up the stairs, the producers find him. They figure out where he is. And in a last-ditch attempt, the director speaks to him directly over the loudspeakers. The director is really the bad guy of the show. He's uh, somebody who's been keeping Truman trapped and has been making this man live a lie his entire life. He speaks to him in this last-ditch effort, this last-ditch attempt to stop Truman. And Truman is faced with a choice. Truman could either stay where he's been his entire life, where he's comfortable, where he's familiar, even though it would be some sort of a lie. Or he can literally step through the door into something unknown, something uncertain, and something new. He can choose familiarity, or he can choose to transition into something else, something unknown. I remember well, very well, the first time that I ever moved, that my family ever moved when I was alive. I had just finished seventh grade in the town that I had lived in my whole life. All my friends, uh, the people I knew, the restaurants I loved, the places I enjoyed, they were all here in this, in this town, the place I called my hometown. But a time came when my dad got a job offer in Colorado, closer to his family, where my grandparents, my uncle, my cousins lived, uh, where my parents had met in high school. There was a lot of draws to go to Colorado. We moved the summer before my eighth grade year, and my bubble, much like Truman's, was popped. It felt like I was Truman, stepping out of the door, even to something completely new and unknown, even though I was just a kid. It took a long time, I think, for me to fully process what that move meant for me fully. Even as I was making new friendships and finding new favorite restaurants and enjoying new places, it took time for me to realize that I was happy about the move, about the transition that I had experienced. Now looking back, that move or that transition, that change was necessary for my own growth, my own journey, and to make me into who I am today. But that transition was no small thing for me. This morning we're going to talk about times of transition. Because we've all gone through them, and maybe we're going through them now. In fact, I know for a fact that we are going through a time of transition, that you are going through a time of transition, and maybe even more than you realize. In our world, there's things like wars, governments and powers changing, shifting, the environment changing. Things are changing. There's uncertainty. Things are transitioning, and you don't know what the future holds. In our country, you may not have realized this, and if you did, I'll have what you're having, but uh, it's an election year, believe it or not. It's an election year. Things are changing. Politics are changing. People are, are shifting. People are having strong opinions. Things are transitioning. You can feel it in the air. How is it going to affect our everyday lives? How is it going to affect my job, my house, my mortgage, my taxes? How is it going to affect me? How is it going to affect the people around me? And here at our church, Laguna Niguel, 
Just last week, our children's pastor, Lynette, we said farewell to her as she moved on from our church. And less than a full month later, after that date, we are going to have a new head pastor coming in at the end of this month. Transitions, changes. Not to mention, school is starting for our kids, with some of our kids going away to college, maybe for the first time. And these are just our communal transitions, to say nothing of whatever personal transitions you may be going through. Changes in your age and what's expected of you. Changes in your family, your family dynamics. Changes in your relationships. Just changes in general. The truth is that some of us here this morning have a bit of an advantage over others when it comes to these transitions. The older you are here among us, the more you have the ability to look back. You have the blessing of looking back. You can see how transitions in your life shaped you into who you are today. Now, I know that we all have some sort of transition or change we can look back on in our life. And though now you can look back on it and you can say, oh, I see how I got through that and how that shaped me into who I am today, chances are in the moment you didn't feel that way. But you did get through it. And whether it was a good change that maybe you saw coming or that you wanted to take place or whether it was a bad change, something you didn't expect or something you tried to prevent, chances are you got through it. You go through things in life and you look back on them as transitions from one thing to something else that makes you something more. This brings us to an important truth this morning. It's that transition is movement. Transition is movement. And this might seem base. It might seem somewhat obvious. Of course, transition is by definition moving from one thing to another. But it's also essential for us to remember now, because as we said, we're all in times of transition right now. Let me ask you something. Why do you think every time an election year comes around, we all kind of brace for something? You know what I mean? There's just something that, that happens the first time you hear somebody mention it's an election year this year. You just, something in kind of you kind of tightens up. You kind of brace. You brace for change. I would say it's because we know that we're about to step through a door, much like Truman did, into the unknown. Maybe the candidate and the form of government you support wins out. Maybe it doesn't. But either way, there's uncertainty about the future, how the world around you will change, how it will not change, how the people around you will react to it, how it will affect you or how it will not affect you. There's uncertainty. We have a new head pastor coming to our ch- to join our church family at the end of this month. And chances are you are feeling somewhat braced for that transition. Now I hope you know that the church went through an extensive process, a prayer build a God-led process to select a search committee that worked with the conference to find appropriate candidates, and they narrowed it down to people that they thought would be a good fit for our church. And then all the church can do at the end of the day is extend an offer. So you also know that the pastor had to choose to want to come here, to want to be a part of this church family. And you know, at least in the back of your head, that God was leading through that process. But despite all those things, you probably are still a little braced for change this morning. Maybe feeling anxious and uncertain, unsure of the unknown. And what about all those personal transitions? The transitions in your personal life, the things that are changing that maybe feel out of your control, the things that are changing around you. You feel like you're leaving the town that was your home and you're stepping into something new, something different. How are you feeling anxious or fearful about your own, your own future this morning? In the book of Joshua, chapter 1, the Israelites are going through some transition. 
Their head pastor was moving, I mean, sorry, their leader prophet Moses, there we go, had just died. He just passed away. Moses had got them to the edge of the promised land, and then he had died, leaving his apprentice, Joshua, in charge to lead after him. They had gotten used to the leadership of Moses for literal decades. Moses had been their leader, the the voice of God to his people for decades. But now they had this new guy. As they were about to go into an incredible transition, moving from the wilderness into the promised land. They had a new leader, a new frontier to enter, and they were undoubtedly experiencing some uncertainty. Also, Joshua himself had to have some fears as well. He was stepping into shoes that must have seemed seemed an infinite number of sizes too large for him to fill. Everyone was feeling uncertain. Everyone was uncertain except for one. In Joshua chapter 1, this is how the book begins. The story of Joshua begins. After Moses, the Lord's servant died. The Lord spoke to Joshua, none son. He had been Moses' helper. My servant Moses is dead. Now get ready to cross over into the Jordan with this entire people to the land that I am going to give to the Israelites. God came to Joshua specifically and said, Hey, look, I know Moses is dead. You're in charge now. Um, By the way, just buckle up and get ready to take care of the people of Israel as we transition into the promised land, something we've been waiting for for a very long time. God says to Joshua, heads up, some transition is going to be happening. But that's not all he says. In verse 5, he says, no one will be able to stand against you during your lifetime. He says this to Joshua. I will be with you in the same way that I was with Moses. I won't desert you or leave you. Be brave and strong because you are the one who will help this people take possession of the land which I pledged to give to their ancestors. Now we've gotten to something important here. Because God tells Joshua, yes, there's going to be a transition. Buckle up, get ready. But he says also, I will be with you. God never expected Joshua to have to go through this transition alone. Nor did he expect the people of Israel to have to either. He continues in verse 7, Be very brave and strong as you carefully obey all of the instruction that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Don't deviate even a bit from it, either to the right or to the left. Then you will have success wherever you go. You see, we know that the reality of life is that we will all go through change. There will inevitably be transitions and uncertainty. Even now, thousands of years after the time of Joshua, this is still true. And yet God has commanded us to do something, commanded us to remember something. Joshua 1.9 says, I've commanded you to be brave and strong, haven't I? Don't be alarmed or terrified because the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. God has commanded us to be strong, to be brave, to be fearless. But not just because he doesn't want us to show weakness. He commands us to not fear because he will be with you wherever you go. What a promise, right? What a gift that we have, knowing that no matter what uncertainties or transitions we may face, that God is with us. So now, because I want to follow God's commandments as a good Christian, I must never be afraid or anxious again, right? Did I get that right? God commands us to be brave and strong and tells us not to fear, so I shouldn't fear, right? I don't want to break one of God's commandments. Or is this commandment perhaps a little less black and white than a do this, don't do that? 
in my personal studies for the past several weeks, I have found myself diving into passages talking about fear and anxiety. I don't think this is because I've been seeking them out, but rather I think the theme has been sticking out to me lately. The more you pay attention to it, the more you realize that the Bible is almost constantly trying to get its readers to stop being afraid. The same Hebrew phrase, Altira, that says, do not tremble or be afraid, in Joshua 1.9, it also appears in Deuteronomy 20, the exact same way. And it's part of the instruction, for, or the law of instruction of how to enter into battle. When you march out to battle, your enemies and you see, uh, to battle your enemies, and you see horses, chariots, and a fighting force larger than yours, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of them, because the Lord your God, the one who brought you up from Egypt, is with you. God's people are literally commanded in the law, the law of Moses, to not be afraid going into battle, because God is with them. It's pretty powerful. In the Gospel of Mark, Jesus appears to his disciples while walking on the waters amidst a terrible storm. And what does he say to them? Seeing him was terrifying to all of them. Just then he spoke to them and he encouraged them, saying, Be encouraged. It is me. Don't be afraid. Jesus said, Fear not. It is I. He said, don't worry, I know there's uncertainty and fear all around you, but it's okay because I'm the one who's here with you. And the Apostle Paul repeatedly encourages Christian believers, like he does in Philippians 4 verse 6. Don't be anxious about anything. Rather, bring up all of your requests to God in your prayers and petitions along with giving thanks. He says, don't be anxious. Instead, pray. But why? For what purpose? Verse 7 after this says, Then the peace of God that exceeds all understanding will keep your hearts and minds safe in Christ Jesus. Verse 7 says, So that the peace of God can come into your life, you must not be anxious but you must bring your troubles, your requests, your petitions, your prayers to God. That peace that surpasses all understanding. I think think that's the key right there. God commands you not to be afraid, but it's for a good reason. You see, where the Truman Show falls a little flat when it comes to reality is he had to step through that door of uncertainty on his own. But here... In reality, in real life, we aren't ever expected just to take that step on our own into the unknown, alone. Yes, we will come to doors that promise change and transition, but you're not going through them alone. You are never going through them alone. You see, this commandment is less a law that you should ironically be afraid of breaking, and it's more a reminder of how much of a loving God we serve. God knows the path for you to live life abundantly, to live life to the fullest, to live life with as little confusion and pain as possible. He knows that transitions and changes in life are inevitable. He doesn't say no pain will happen, no change will happen, no transition will happen. But he says, don't be afraid because he knows you don't need to be afraid because he is with you. Think about that for just a moment. We believe we can trust God. That's a powerful thing. But how amazing is it that you don't just have a God you can trust. You have a God who demands that you not be afraid, that you not overthink, that you not stress or be anxious because he is going to care for you. What is it that Jesus said in the book of Luke? He said, aren't five sparrows sold for two small coins? Yet not one of them is overlooked by God. Even the hairs on your head are all counted. Don't be afraid. You are worth more than sparrows. 
Don't be afraid because God watches over the sparrow and you are worth so much more than just a little bird. So let's go back to Joshua and the people of Israel. A people going through change, a people going through transition and uncertainty. A people that each of us today can empathize with. And what is it? What is it that God says to them before any other commandment or instruction? Before they go tumble the walls of Jericho, he says, I've commanded you to be brave and strong. Haven't I? Don't be alarmed or terrified because the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. Do not be anxious or worried about the future because he is your God. Are you feeling anxious this morning? Do you have that knot in your chest? Do you have that feeling of being braced for some sort of change, for some sort of uncertainty? Did the list going through this morning, things going on in our world, things going on in our country, in our church, in your personal life, did it spike your anxiety a little bit? If it did, I'm, I'm sorry that's not my goal, but it also is a reminder. It's a reminder that I have for you this morning. Do not be afraid. Are you anxious about politics? Are you anxious about the way that our country is heading? Are you anxious about who's going to win, about who's going to win the electoral, about which states are going to do what, about what your personal state representative is going to do? Are you anxious about that? God has commanded you, do not be afraid. Are you anxious about war and strife in this world? You see pain and people around this world. You see the news. You, see, you watch the, the TVs and the images going on. Are you anxious about that? God has commanded you, do not be afraid. Are you fearful for this church and what a new pastor and a change might bring? Are you worried for what that means for your family, for your kids, for your parents, for whatever it is? Are you worried for what that means for this congregation? God has commanded us, do not be afraid. Are you fearful for what's happening in your family? The decisions your loved ones are making, the dynamics of your family are changing. Or maybe you're just feeling like things are out of control, changing faster than you can keep up with. God has commanded you, do not be afraid. But why? Does God just expect us to blindly ignore our emotions and our anxieties? No, certainly not. But he does call you to not worry when he is in control. To not fear when he's in control. Another spoiler alert, God is always in control. Are you at a door in your life, a time of transition? Like Truman, are you faced with the terrifying choice of staying where you are and what you've known, or is choosing to move forward into something new and something unknown? I have news for you. If you're standing at that door here this morning, Guess who's on the other side? Jesus is standing at the door and knocking. Jesus is standing at the door and knocking. He beckons you to come through a journey of life with him. But the reason Jesus stands at the door and knocks isn't just because he wants to come into your heart. Yes, he does. But it's because he doesn't want you to take a step out your front door, a step through that door into the unknown, without having him right there, hand in hand, step for step with you. Jesus beckons you to a journey through life, but he commands you to not go through it alone. Can you say yes to a journey with Jesus this morning? Can we as a church say yes to walking with Jesus through transition, through an election year, through a change in leadership here at our church, through whatever personal things we may be going? Can we agree to walk with Jesus through that? Can we choose to obey the commandments of God and to fear not and to pray for that peace that may surpass our understanding of what's going on. Can we walk into the unknown, holding the hand of God who will never leave us or forsake us? Remember what Jesus said to his disciples in the storm. He said, be encouraged. It's me who's with you. Don't be afraid. So let us not be afraid. Amen.